Hey everybody, this is Mr. Maupin coming at you with another AP US government video. Today we're taking a look at topic 1.3, government power and individual rights. And this section is primarily basically focusing in on, you know, the significance of why the Constitution is so important. Uh, when the Constitution is put together, it's obviously a framework for government and it's going to try to improve upon the shortcomings of the previous Articles of Confederation, but also try to make sure it does not slip back into some of the tyrannical aspects of what was colonial rule. Uh, so when the Constitution is created in 1787, it is agreed upon by the writers, uh, the folks that were the delegates of that meeting in Philadelphia, uh, representing the various states, but just because that group in Philadelphia approved the Constitution did not mean that it actually went into effect. Per the Constitution, and as it was set up, you needed to have at least nine of the 13 states agree to ratify this new plan for government for this plan of government to go into effect. So the idea being is, you know, once you've created this framework and a mechanism for it to go into effect, you now have to take this plan of government and present it to all 13 state governments that were, were existing at the time, still under the Articles of Confederation, and basically ask them to ditch the Articles of Confederation and formally adopt uh, the uh, this new thing called the Constitution. Now, once again, just because these folks in Philadelphia at the convention believe this is a great new plan for government, that doesn't mean that everybody else is going to feel the same way. And, you know, just like anything else, you know, I don't care if it's a, a taco or a shoe, you know, or whatever. If you're trying to sell somebody on something, you've got to promote it. You've got to advertise. You've got to explain to people why this thing, whatever it is that you're selling, so to speak, should be what you should buy. And in this case, what was being sold was the Constitution to the various state legislatures. And to basically do what is, in essence, you know, uh, a, a mass advertising campaign in support of the Constitution, you're going to see the work of three of the uh, of three critical founding fathers: uh, John Jay to the left, uh, Alexander Hamilton to the right, and in the middle, James Madison. These three collectively are going to create what's going to be known as the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers are a series of letters that are going to be published in newspapers across America that are going to be designed to try to give reasons as to why the Constitution should be ratified. Now, every Federalist paper, so to speak, is going to focus in on some aspect of or some specific argument as to why the Constitution should be ratified. You know, we'll look at other later parts of uh, the Federalist Papers that will focus specifically on, for example, checks and balances. You'll see another Federalist Paper that will specifically take a look at the power of the presidency and the power of the courts and, you know, things like that. Uh, there are, you know, well over, you know, 80 uh, of these Federalist Papers that will be created. Uh, but notes, the one that we're going to be taking a look at specifically is the one that's considered the most important, uh, the one that certainly come AP test time, you need to know, I would say for sure, uh, is Federalist number 10. And Federalist number 10 is going to be penned uh, by the man that will eventually be known as the father of the Constitution. Uh, he might be diminutive in size, five foot four and about 140 pounds, but strong in mind, uh, James Madison right there in the middle. Now, Madison is going to uh, compose Federalist 10 like many of the other Federalist papers. They're going to be published with anonymity. Uh, Madison is going to use the name Publius uh, as the pseudonym under which he is going to write this document. Uh, and Publius is, you know, is a Latin word, and it basically means a person of the people. Uh, and that in and of itself kind of sends a message in terms of, you know, that, hey, what is being proposed here is what's good for the people. And so this should be taken seriously. It should be you know, embraced lovingly, so to speak, as something really, really good. Now, what Federalist 10 
you know, kind of does is kind of give an overall broad kind of an explanation as to kind of why we need to have this new framework for government. So it's a little, it's broader than a lot of the other federal spheres that tend to kind of zero in on something specific. And one of the, the big things that kind of sets the stage for Federalist 10 is this concept of what are known as factions. Uh, you know, Madison uses that term by name, factions. But, you know, today we would kind of interpret factions as being, uh, you know, groups of people that are working together for a shared goal, uh, specific purposes, uh, you know, and these would kind of be, in today's terms, these might be embodied like, you know, in the form of interest groups, like, say, the NRA or the NAACP or, you know, PETA or something like that. Uh, but it could also be applied to political parties like the Democrats, Republicans, etc. That, in other words, they are a group that have specific goals and that what that group tries to do is get their specific goals accomplished. Now, in many respects, you know, we we are very comfortable and used to having interest groups and political parties in our system. They've been around for a long, long time. Uh, but for many of the founding fathers, including Madison, factions are kind of a dirty word. Uh, it, it, these are not positive things. Uh, in fact, for somebody like Madison, you know, political parties, if you want to think of it that way, are something to be feared, something to be, you know, worried about. Um and the question then becomes, well, why? Why should we, we be afraid of factions? Well, the argument is that factions are bad by definition because they put their own interest goals ahead of what's best for the country. So it might be, you know, the sense of the NRA putting interests of gun owners ahead of the greater interests of the nation or, you know, the Democratic Party uh, and its goals are, are, you know, not in line with what's best for the country necessarily. So that's kind of why factions are kind of poo-pooed amongst, you know, the founders for the most part. So the question, you know, that's asked is, okay, we don't like factions. Factions are bad. So how will this new framework for government, you know, address this problem of factions? And what's even more pressing is that factions were viewed as one of the reasons why the Roman Republic collapses. Uh, these founding fathers were obsessed with the Roman Republic. They wanted to basically improve upon that as well by kind of trying to, you know, study, and they were scholars, many of them, about what are going to be the things that caused the Roman Republic to fall, and factions were one of those things. Now, with that being said, though, you might think, oh, okay, well, Madison's going to kind of, you know, argue that the Constitution will, you know, eliminate factions, but in fact... Madison doesn't say that. Madison says that factions, by definition, cannot be eliminated. They're, they're just so embedded. It's so part of human nature. It's logical that you as a human being will want to work with other people for a shared purpose. So he, he's very you know quick to assert that you can't destroy these things. But what you can do under the Constitution is that you can limit their impact. You can limit what is viewed as kind of their inherently negative impact. And the question then is, well, how? How does that happen? Well, part of how you can kind of limit the power of a singular faction from taking over is having a system of government where the responsibilities, the powers of government are separated into different groups. And the Constitution does that. It doesn't place all the power in a singular legislature. It creates a Congress to create laws, but a separate body called the presidency to enforce those laws. And an even separate uh, body, the court, the federal courts, the Supreme Court, to interpret what those laws mean. And in a later Federalist paper, to, it's, it's basically inferred that their job would be to determine what constitutionality is. And so the idea being is that, well, if you're a faction, if you want to be in total control... You can't just control one part of one branch of government. You might control Congress, but that's not going to give you tyrannical control over the federal government. You'd have to control all three branches, and that's a hard thing to do. Furthermore, uh, factions are limited uh, because of the fact that we have a federalist system, hence the term federalist papers. Uh, a federalist style of government 
creates separations in powers of government, not just amongst branches, but amongst levels of government. In our government of the Constitution, it's not a singular national government that has all the power. Now, it has supreme power under Article 6, but it doesn't have all the power. The federal government has certain powers that are listed, you know, in Article 1, Section 8, but understand that beyond that, you know, it it gives, or it seems to, at least even pre-Tenth Amendment, that what's not listed there, one could assume, would then be powers that would be, you know, absorbed by the specific state government. So one example of this would be public education. You know, nowhere in the Constitution does it stipulate the federal government has the power over public education. It just doesn't. So one would infer that if it's not listed there for the federal government, then that must be a state power. And that's important because when you divvy up power in government amongst the federal government and the numerous state governments, that makes it even harder for a singular faction to tyrannize the entire country. You know, today, for example, you know, if one political party wanted to, you know, have total control over the country, they would have to control not just the three branches of the federal government, but also all 50 governments, which also have three branches of government each. So that is virtually impossible to do. So, you know, this framework for government is set up to kind of, you know, prevent that faction from being able to take total control. So when you divide up government into branches and divide it up amongst levels, it really chops up government in so many pieces that it's very difficult for one group to totally control everything. Now, Ferguson also talks about uh, democracy. And, you know, we always talk about America being the land of democracy, and we love and embrace democracy, which is true. But the Founding Fathers had some qualms with what they considered to be democracy. In their view, what they would consider to be a true democracy is what we would call today a direct democracy, where every single person gets to vote on every single thing. So as long as you're a citizen, you would vote on every single thing, basically as a part of the government. Uh, Madison's going to have a problem with that. Not because it was per se impractical because of numbers necessarily, uh, but it, well, I mean, that was part of it. But beyond that, there was a concern that, you know, can we trust the common person with that kind of power? Is, is, is that going to be what's good? And because a lot of the Founding Fathers didn't quite have, you know, you know, the, the highest regard for the average person, common person, uh, Madison will argue that the better form of democracy was called a republic or a representative democracy, where the people have a voice, they choose representatives, but it's those representatives that have the actual power to make decisions for the government. The idea being is that you would choose the best people to look out for the overall best needs of the public, whereas the perception amongst many of the founders was that the common man would only look out for themselves, not for the betterment of the country. And note, since America is a large country, having a large republic is going to be especially good. Because the larger the republic you have, the bigger the country, the larger the population, you've got a bigger pool of people to choose from. So whatever representatives are chosen are going to be the best people to make the best decisions for the country. And once again, you know, in a large republic with lots of people, it's hard for a singular faction to control everybody when choosing representatives. So understand that the idea of having a representative government, a large republic, separated into various branches and federal versus state governments, these are all things that are going to be able to protect us from what we would consider to be the tyranny of factions, a singular group that would only care about their own specific goals at the, you know, at the expense of what is necessary or best for the country. So of all the Federalist Papers, Federalist 10 is certainly the most important, uh, you know, certainly the one to know uh, uh, amongst all of them. So we'll leave it there. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.